Hi there! There's a language called Latgalian. It's spoken in Latgale, which is the easternmost region of a small country in Europe called Latvia. Despite being closely related, Latvian and Latgalian are not the same language. Please join me in a fascinating adventure through the history of Latgale and its people, and I promise you that by the end of this video, you'll have found a new appreciation for the incredible world of Latgalian. My name is Sean, and welcome to my channel, which I use as an outlet for my obsession with obscure endangered languages. Today's topic is particularly close to my heart, as it has to do with Latvia, the country I grew up in. So this video is going to be a bit long, because I have a lot to say. This beautiful, amazing, boring, depressing, mysterious, and crazy country that you should definitely visit what are you waiting for by a plane ticket right now. In case you're unfamiliar, Latvia is a country located in the northeast of Europe on the coast of the Baltic Sea. It's bordered by Estonia to the north, Lithuania to the south, and Russia and Belarus to the east. The population of Latvia is about 2 million people, the capital city is Riga, the sole official language is Latvian, it used to be part of the Soviet Union but it has since regained independence, joined the European Union, and is now a pretty awesome place to be, for the most part. Now, while Latvia is divided into an absurd 100 and something administrative divisions, people generally refer to the four historical and cultural districts as specified in the constitution. Vidzeme, Kurzeme, Zemgale, and the region this video is about, Latgale. Ah, Latgale. This is where all Latvians go to visit their grandma, pick berries and mushrooms, and celebrate Jani. To quote Catherine Gibson in her fascinating essay on the development of the Latgalian language, Latgale is ethno-linguistically distinct from the western regions of present-day Latvia, and is, in many ways, the least Latvian. Though it is important to mention that historically it's been Latvia's poorest and most underdeveloped region with the lowest GDP, highest rates of unemployment and outward migration, which hence the many jokes and stereotypes. And this is why Latgale oftentimes gets forgotten and neglected on the political stage, which honestly is a real shame because it's such a culturally rich and historically significant area with lots to do and lots to see, but like nobody ever goes there or knows about it. But this is especially true when it comes to the Latgalian language, which, according to the Constitution of Latvia, is nothing more than a vasturisk Latvia Shuvaloda Spavades. In other words, it's considered to be merely a dialect of Latvian and not its own separate language. Now, we can discuss the differences between languages and dialects until the cows come home, and it's usually super vague and unclear where the boundary is. But extremely basically, similar to how a country is only a country if other countries decide it's a country, a language is only a language if enough people decide so. But here's a few phrases in Latvian and Latgalian, just so you can kind of get a better idea of what we're talking about. Labdien, lobadina. Esmu no Latgales, asu no Latgolis. Man patīk mācīties, man patīk vuicēties. Tas nav labi, itis nalabi. In any case, to understand the historical background of the region as a whole, we have to briefly go back about a thousand years or so. There used to be a whole lot of different tribes inhabiting the whole general northeastern Baltic region, which, for the most part, correspond to the historical and cultural districts that I mentioned earlier, which would go on to make up modern-day Latvia and the modern Latvian people. The whole region of present-day Latvia and Estonia, more or less collectively, was commonly referred to as Livonia, technically named after the Livonian people, but honestly, they have always had very little to do with the politics of the region, so in that regard, the name Livonia itself is a bit misleading. Story for another time. but. For the purposes of this video, just know that the common geographical term for this whole area was Livonia. In the early Middle Ages, the Livonian Crusade happened, and for the following many hundreds of years, everyone in Europe and their grandma wanted the peace of this land. The Polish, the Lithuanians, the Polish Lithuanians, the Swedish, the Germans, the Danish Norwegians, the Russians, on top of the numerous indigenous tribes already inhabiting the area, all fighting over these lands for centuries. It was an ever-changing, inconsistent mess. But by the late 1500s, most of everything in this area, including most of Livonia, becomes part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This period of history is also known as uh, <coughs> the peak of uh, Lithuanian relevancy. It's a joke, bralukai. You know, like we like we like to joke, we like to have fun around here. It's ashiwokauju bralukai. <laughs> Anyway, while all of this is happening, a new hot, hip and cool branch of Christianity, known as Lutheranism, is spreading through Northern Europe like wildfire. And by the end of the 16th century, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and many parts of the Holy Roman Empire had already recognized Lutheranism as a totally legit state religion. This will be important in a bit. Fast forward to the 1620s, when, after yet another war, Sweden gained control of pretty much all of Livonia. However, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth retained a part of it, a part that was called the Inflanti Voivodship, also known as Polish Livonia, and this was pretty much the alpha version of Latgale and was the event that marked the birth of the region as we know it today. 
It is from here on out that Latgalians and the rest of their fellow Latvians will now be developing somewhat separately for the next few hundred years, because the rest of modern-day Latvia will now be a part of the Duchy of Kurland and Semigalia, which had a sizable Baltic German population and was being more influenced by them. Furthermore, it was mostly just a vassal state of Poland-Lithuania, which means they had a lot more autonomy regarding political affairs. Latgale, on the other hand, was pretty much fully a part of Poland-Lithuania, and because of that was being more influenced by the Polish and Lithuanians. That is until the year 1772, when after the first partition of Poland, the Inflanti Voivodship was incorporated into the Russian Empire, and soon after, in 1795, after the third partition of Poland, the rest of modern-day Latvia followed suit as well. Hear ye, hear ye. This is all a gross oversimplification of thousands of years of history. Please swallow multiple grains of salt now. In any case, remember how I mentioned Lutheranism five seconds ago and how a large part of Northern Europe converted to it by this point? Well, the Polish Lithuanians did not, because they were, are, and probably always will be proudly Catholic. What this means is that even to this day, Latgalians are majority Catholic, along with the Polish and Lithuanians, while the rest of Latvia is majority Lutheran, along with Estonia and the Nordic countries. This is important not only for the cultural aspect, but also in terms of language. You see, Latgalian was written down using the Latin Antiqua type, influenced by Polish spelling, while Latvian was being more influenced by German and Swedish, and was written using the Gothic Fraktur type. This becomes even more significant in the late 19th century, when after the failed January Uprising of 1863, the Russian Empire imposed a ban on any publications using the Latin alphabet. Moreover, for a time, Polish and Lithuanian publications were prohibited, and in some areas it was even forbidden to speak these languages in general. It was part of a larger Russification plan, and while the ban was mostly directed specifically at the Poles and Lithuanians, you bet your ass it extended to a bunch of other minorities as well, especially Lilgalians, because at the end of the day, a non-Russian is a non-Russian is a devilish threat to the glory of the motherland, friggin' obviously. In general, over the centuries, for whatever weird reasons, Latgalians were always treated notably worse than their fellow Latvians. To quote Catherine Gibson once again, Being Catholics, Latgalians were treated as Poles, or at least as potential Poles, who wrote in the Polish script, and thus also deserved discriminatory treatment. This differed from Lutheran Latvian speakers, whom the Russian Empire regarded if not as loyal subjects, then as less dangerous than the openly rebellious Poles. Speaking of which, Potential Poles is the name of my new alternative indie punk band, trademark pending. Thankfully, none of this bullcrap stopped Gustav's Mante Felis, a Baltic German slash Polish Latgalian historian, linguist and activist who published the first Latgalian language calendar, including pictures and practical advice on housekeeping, farming and medicine, along with short stories and poems in the Latgalian language. This was the first and only 19th century anything to be published regularly in Latgalian. This guy is considered to be the first notable publisher of Latgalian literature, and after the Latin type ban was finally lifted in 1904, Monte Felis became a true inspiration for the upcoming Latgalian National Awakening. The first third, let's say, of the 20th century was a time when Latgalian truly flourished for a bit. In 1903, you had the first conference on Latgalian spelling. In 1908, Anton Skrinda published the first book on Latgalian grammar. There were multiple newspapers in circulation, even in St. Petersburg, Russia, though most of them were quite short-lived. But there was the Geisma, then came the Sakla, then came the Ausiklis, and even the Driva, and a bunch of others. Around the same time, a guy by the name of Franz Kemps wrote an essay titled Latgaliashi. He also popularized the territorial name Latgola, and just all of the above things together, it looked like Latgalian was truly starting to emerge. A sense of unity was slowly arising. A really cool quote from the Driva newspaper in 1915 proclaimed, To put it short, we're Latgalians and they are Balts, but both sides put together are Latvians. This is an extremely important sentiment because even today, though I'm sure there will be some people who disagree with me on this, but based on what I've read and researched and the people I've spoken to, the vast majority of Latgalians would readily identify themselves as Latvian alongside Latgalian. Nevertheless, this doesn't mean diminishing their sense of a unique Latgalian identity at the same time. In 1917, after the February Revolution slapped the Russian Empire with a bit of freedom, discussions were heating up about the creation of an independent Latvian state. And so, the first Latgalian Congress was held in Rezekne to discuss various Latgalian topics, and being incorporated into a larger Latvian state was one of them. 
There's actually a cool 11 minute Latgalian short film made a few years ago called Gambit of 1917 specifically about this topic. And I found a version with English subtitles and I'm gonna leave a link to it in the description below in case you wanna look at it. By the way, Rezekne is a really cool quaint little town. A few years ago me and some friends drove three and a half hours there and then three and a half hours back to Riga in the same day to attend a Latgalian rap concert hosted in a kebab shop. Good times, totally worth it. <laughs> anyway, Latvia gains independence in 1918, and in 1920, Latgale is officially incorporated into the independent Republic of Latvia. From 1920 to 1934, for the first and only time ever, Latgalian was made a co-official language in the local self-government and education in Latgale as part of the Latvian government's policy of minority rights. The reason it was cut short is because in 1934, a certain Karlis Ulmanis, who had already managed to be the Prime Minister of Latvia four times by this point, orchestrates a coup d'etat and names himself the President of Latvia. Ulmanis is a bit of a controversial figure in Latvian politics. From one side, he heavily developed the country, improved the economy, and increased literacy rates, but from another point of view, he also banned all political parties except his, banned all independent media outlets, called himself the leader of the people, and just had a lot of authoritarian tendencies in general. On top of that, he was a very hard Latvian nationalist and always reminded everyone that Latvia saula speed per visium, which meant less minority rights and cultural and linguistic assimilation, which extended to Latgalians, who were now banned from publishing and learning in their language again. Anyway, knock knock. Enter the 1940s and enter the Soviet Union into the Baltics. However, barely a year later, from 1941 to 1944, Latvia was being occupied by some racist clowns. But very surprisingly, the racist clowns actually allowed Latgalians to open a publishing house and even encouraged a Latgalian identity, separate from a Latvian one. However, this was done for all the wrong reasons. I mean, these are racist clowns we're talking about. You see, the Nazis had a plan, a plan called Generalplan Öst. The purpose of which, very basically, was to decide who's gonna get genocided and who isn't. To put it mildly, the Nazis did not like the Latgalians. According to historian Romuald J. Misiunas, the Generalplan Öst of the SS chief Heinrich Himmler envisaged the deportation of almost 50% of Estonians, 50% of Latvians, 85% of Lithuanians, and all Latgalians. The remaining fraction was evaluated racially as Nordic and thus worthy of Germanization. So you see, encouraging a Latgalian identity, separate from a Latvian one, was done as a very sick and twisted but clever attempt at pinning the Latgalians and Latvians against each other. It's weird, because it's like the Nazis give the Latgalians this glimmer of hope that, hey, maybe life ain't so bad after all. And then, like the racist clowns that they are, the Nazis go like, Well, have you had your fun, little Latgalians? Great, because now it's time to die, because you're filthy and you're stinky and you kind of gross me out. I'm sorry. I don't make the rules, I'm just a racist piece of scheisse. In any case, a horrible time with the Nazis was spent, and back to the Soviet Union, Latgalians went. During the USSR, the Russian language ruled supreme above all others. Everything had to be done in Russian, и все должны были говорить по-русски as well. Now, while speaking the national languages of the individual Soviet republics wasn't banned per se, but because of various heavy Russification policies, it was very discouraged. And like, why would you speak Latvian, or especially Latgalian, if you can speak Russian instead? Like. So after the fall of the Union, most of its former member states sought to reverse this by elevating their own native languages to sole official status, and a period of mass national reawakenings began in the late 80s and early 90s. In the case of Latvia, it was Latvian, Latvian, Latvian from now on. Makes sense, right? Yeah, but Latvia, some may argue, takes it a bit too far with the whole Latvianizing foreign names, inventing new words for things that nobody will ever use, all of which costs public money, and Latvia has plenty of other pressing matters to worry about, and suppressing or actively ignoring national and linguistic minorities similar to how Russia did it back in the good old days. But enough about the depressing parts of history, things finally started picking up for Latgalian in the 90s and early 2000s, and today, in 2021, it is absolutely incredible to see what the Latgalian community had been able to achieve. I'm gonna quickly go down some of the more iconic and interesting, in my opinion, achievements, as well as their significance in the resurgence of the Latgalian language and culture in the 21st century. There's a guy called Juris Tsibuls who worked extensively in creating grammar books, story books, and various teaching materials for adults and children alike, and thanks to him, awareness really started to spread. If you're learning Latgalian, chances are you'll be using some of Tsibuls' material whether you know it or not. Also, fun fact about him, turns out that for decades he's been collecting these elementary grammar books called primers in various languages, and as of this year, he is estimated to have about 10,290 books from 220 countries and 1,180 languages in his collection. 
And you can see a catalog of his entire collection, like literally hundreds of pages on his website, the link of which is going to be in the description below. And that is just the craziest collection I've ever heard about. Like, what a legend. Also, on his website, there's a Latgalian language option, which just makes this all so much cooler. For a while, a summer school called Vosorvoshana and a summer camp called Adzolis were financed by the Latvian Cultural Capital Fund, where children were immersed in the Latgalian language. In 2005, the LGSC was founded, otherwise known as the Student Center of Latgale, aimed at developing and spreading awareness of the Latgalian language and culture. In 2007, they actually protested in the center of Riga for more recognition, and it was like a national news and everything. That same year, the LGSC managed to achieve official recognition of a Latgalian orthography, which is a huge deal. Activism also succeeded in implementing Latgalian afternoon language classes in several schools, on top of establishing Via Latgalica and the science of Latgalistics, which is a real thing and it's so cool. In 2010, the International Organization for Standardization officially assigned Latgalian an Internet Language Code, LTG, which you can see being used in the Latgalian translation of Wikipedia, which is also a real thing and will also be in the description below. That same year, activist Maris Rumax revealed his design for a flag of Latgale, which was flown at a sports competition. And even though it remains unofficial under Latvian law, it's been pretty much adopted by most Latgalians, and you can even see it being flown at the Latgalian representative office in Riga and a ton of other places and events. And in 2011, perhaps one of the biggest achievements to date, the former Latvian Bureau of Lesser Used Languages successfully lobbied for the inclusion of Latgalian in the 2011 national census for the first time ever. The question of which language they use at home, which originally only included Latvian, Russian, Belarusian and others, please specify which, was changed to include do you use Latgalian, a subtype of the Latvian language, on a daily basis? Which is still kind of a bitchy way of phrasing it, but still progress. Now get this, a few years ago, as part of an effort to commemorate the centenary of the First Latgalian Congress of 1917 and the centenary of the First Latvian Republic of 1918, the Rezekne Academy of Technologies came out with the first ever Latgalian video game. That's right, a Latgalian video game. It's called Isapazesim, or Iapazesimias in Latvian, which roughly means like, let's get to know each other or let's get acquainted. And it's basically a point and click adventure where you learn about all the significant events in Latgalian and Latvian history, as well as about the people who were a part of it all. Like, isn't it cool to be living in the same universe as a Latgalian video game existing? Link is gonna be in the description below. Now you might be thinking, okay, okay. It can't get any crazier than this, can it? Yes, it can. Wait till you hear about Latgalian road signs and Latgalian ATM options, which Whenever I take out money, I always pick Latgalian. Hopefully it increases their numbers and they never discontinue it. There's Latgalian ways. There's a bunch of official TED Talks translated into Latgalian. There's Latgalian kebab, which is objectively delicious and don't let any uncultured people tell you otherwise. You know who you are. There are multiple Latgalian news websites, a ton of learning materials, online dictionaries, a corpus with over 1 million entries. There's a bunch of YouTube channels dedicated to teaching Latgalian. There's a Latgalian Instagram page with near daily updates and stories and various things. So also no excuses with not learning, eh? There's hashtag names, which is the Latgalian way of not giving a fuck. There's multiple music bands like Bespeve N, Burova MC, and Latgalishu Reps, which literally means Latgalian rap. And these are the guys that I saw perform live at the aforementioned town of Rezekne at the aforementioned kebab place. They have millions of views on YouTube and have been really helping Latgalian enter the Latvian mainstream and make it hip and cool for the youth of today. And they actually have a few solid bangers, like definitely worth to check them out. There's also a yearly event called Bonyuks, which is basically when everybody gets together to celebrate the various achievements that help promote Latgalian language and culture over the past year. Think of it as kind of like a Latgalian Oscars, which is pretty cool. And the last thing that I can't not mention is this. While doing research, I came across a thing called Latgali Shuvoludai Draudzeiga Vita, which literally means a friendly place for the Latgalian language. And it's a cool little initiative that comes in the form of these cool neat little stickers that businesses stick on their window, so that if you speak Latgalian, you can request service in this business in Latgalian. And there's even an interactive map of where these places exist. Now, most of them are in Latgale, makes sense. And then there's a few in Riga, which, you know, still Latvia still makes sense, and then you zoom out a little bit, and it turns out that there's a place like this in Poznan in Poland, which is definitely, you know, it's it's interesting, it's kind of funky, but like we're still in the same general area, makes sense. But then you zoom out some more and you go over the Atlantic Ocean, and there's a place like this in friggin' Houston, Texas. Like what? Turns out there's an honorary consul of the Republic of Latvia in the state of Texas. His name is Peter A. Ragaus, and it just so happens that he's Latgalian, and he's promoting Latgalian language and culture in Texas. 
I actually found an interview with him on Latvia Weekly, and if you want to listen to this fascinating story, then link is going to be in the description below. Also, apparently this guy was one of the people helping to implement illumination of Niagara Falls in Latvian colors for the centenary of independence in 2018. And remember earlier I mentioned the Lagalian short film Gambit of 1917 with English subtitles? Turns out, who provided English subtitles for that movie? This same guy. Like, I feel like we just came full circle here. How is everything so interconnected? If the Latgalian community isn't the coolest in the world, I don't know who is. <sighs> okay, I got a bit carried away there, I admit, but how could I not? How could I read about all these cool things and not share them with the world? And there's so much more I could have mentioned, like Latgalian pottery and Latgalian cinema and Latgalian radio, and I haven't even touched on how the education system works or the proportion of children learning it at school or what the attitudes of the people are or... I'll stop now. Links to everything in the description below. But before transitioning to the conclusion of this video, I think it would be rather remiss and irresponsible of me to not at least give you a little glimpse into how Latgalian grammar works or what Latgalian really is as a language. So according to the 2011 census, there were approximately 164,500 people who spoke Latgalian, which at the time was about 8.8% of the population of Latvia. On top of that, about 35.5% of the population of Latgala claimed to speak Latgalian daily. And there's some other estimates that range from around 150,000 to as high as 200,000. But truth be told, it's probably, unfortunately, less nowadays. Latgalian is part of the Eastern Baltic branch of the Indo-European language family, and is written using the Latin script. Now, to explain the Latgalian alphabet, I think it would make sense to explain the Latvian alphabet first, just for some context. Now, the Latvian alphabet is the Latin script, but with the exclusion of the letters Q, X, W, and Y, and with the addition of SH, Ch, Z, L, N, T, D. These two letters, which are pronounced as a soft T and D respectively in Latvian, like T, D, in Latgalian are sometimes pronounced as a soft K and G, which definitely makes more sense orthographically, but as a speaker of standard Latvian myself, it just sounds silly. When it comes to vowels, there's a stick called a garumzime, which literally means long sign and it makes the sound longer, like the difference between A and A, except for the letter O. The letter O never has a garumzime on it in standard Latvian. It just doesn't exist. The Latgalian alphabet is pretty much the same as the Latvian one, except with two additional letters. Firstly, in some cases, Latgalian does actually allow a garumzime above the O. Second, the biggest noticeable difference is that Latgalian has the letter Y, representing the U sound, which Latvian does not have, but Lithuanian does. At the same time though, despite there being a standardized orthography, it's not uncommon to find different spellings for different words. At least that was my experience while doing research. It just didn't seem very consistent, especially older material. Also the O with the garumzima seems to be slowly fading away from modern writing, but like with the rise of the internet, I'm sure the orthography is going to start getting more consistent with time. Latgalian is a dependent marking nominative accusative language with seven grammatical cases and six declensions, just like Latvian. If you're a native English speaker and you've never dealt with a Baltic language before, or at least a Slavic language before, it's gonna be tough. They're, they're pretty tough. Because also, while the basic word order is subject-verb-object, thanks to the magic of cases and declensions, the word order can be and is oftentimes ignored in everyday colloquial speech, which means the words may be placed willy-nilly all over the place and still make grammatical sense because each word, be it a noun, a verb, or an adjective, encode enough grammatical information in and of themselves that the word order, for the most part, only serves to emphasize certain things rather than be an end-all rigid rule. Wait till you hear about Uralic languages like Estonian with its 14 cases, which I made a video about, or Hungarian with its 18 cases, or North Caucasian languages like Tsez with an alleged whopping 64 goddamn cases, which at that point is just ridiculous, but it's still really cool. Going off topic again, anyway, being a Baltic language, Latgalian is closely related to Latvian and they're both highly mutually intelligible, but not always. In some circumstances, Latgalian is closer to Lithuanian, having borrowed loads of vocabulary from it. For example, the word for always in Latvian is vienmer, while in Latgalian and Lithuanian respectively, it's visod and visad. The word for dress in Latvian is kleita, while in Latgalian and Lithuanian respectively, it's sukne and suknele. The word for scissors in Latvian is šķēres, while in Latgalian and Lithuanian respectively, zirklis, zirkles. Last name or surname in Latvian is uzvārds, while in Latgalian and Lithuanian respectively, it's pavorde and pavarde. 
Interestingly enough, even though this is kind of controversial, the thing you hear about Lithuanian sometimes is that it's considered to be the oldest and most conservative quote-unquote in the European language, having loads in common with Latin, Ancient Greek, and Sanskrit. And then technically, because Latgalian is closer to Lithuanian than Latvian is to Lithuanian, it could maybe possibly potentially be said that Latgalian is the second most oldest and conservative in the European language. I don't know, but it's a cool thought. <laughs> Though there's also another language called Samogitian or Jamaitian, which is another divergent Baltic dialect slash language, but in Lithuania. I'm only briefly mentioning it now, but it could warrant a whole other separate video because they also have a rich history and culture that isn't often talked about. And I guess because that's closer to Lithuanian, maybe that's the second most conservative one, and then Latgalian would be third, and then Latvian would be fourth, and I guess you could call Samogitian the Latgalian of Lithuania. Or I guess you could call it Galian the Samogitian of Latvia, for any Lithuanians watching out there. Anyway, I probably made a bunch of people angry with these comparisons, and if I said anything wrong, please do feel free to correct me in the comments. So is Latgalian a language or simply a dialect of Latvian? Well, the Latvian government says it's a dialect, but most Latgalians themselves call it a language. Personally me, I'd say it deserves to be called a separate language. If Moldovan is different enough from Romanian to be called a language, if Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, and Montenegrin are all separate languages, then Latgalian should also be called a separate language. Thing is, it heavily depends on whether you look at it from a linguistic scientific perspective or from a political perspective. So, I don't know, take your pick. But with that, I feel like it's a good place to start concluding the video. Originally, I thought this video was going to be really short and quick, but the more I kept reading, the more I kept adding and adding, and I just couldn't stop. And I thought I'd just go all out and help spread awareness of this beautiful language and culture that personifies the Latgalian people. I'll be leaving a ton of links in the description below for further reading, as well as a lot of resources for studying. I just want to quickly reiterate that, despite all the success that the Latgalian community has had in preserving their language and culture over the past few decades, the number of speakers is likely going to decrease as time goes on. Just like literally thousands of languages across the world are facing extinction over the next century, Latgalian is not entirely safe from this fate either. If you are part of a community that speaks a small language, please, speak it, live it, and pass it on to future generations. These languages are a piece of us all, and once they're gone, in the overwhelming vast majority of cases, it means they're gone forever. Sorry for that little depressing note at the end there, but it has to be said. A language doesn't have to have millions of speakers to be vibrant, you know? For some, it was, is, and always will be. Either way, I hope that one day you get the chance to visit Latgale, and Latvia in general as well, and experience this wonderful hidden gem of a country. I feel like the best way to end this video would be by quoting a speech by Arnis Ziedinj, a representative of Ludza County in Latgale. The Latgalians are a very special people. Their language is special and their culture is special. Even if oppressed, even if poor, Latgalian folk are tough, and thus have been able to resist, to stay alive, and will manage to do the same in the future. God bless Latvia, and God bless Latgale. Thank you so much for watching, have a good day and a wonderful night, I'm excited to hear your thoughts in the comments, and if this video inspires even at least one person to learn Latgalian, or any other language for that matter, I consider that a win. Peace out.